Okay, so before I get into the spooks and mystery, let me start by saying that all this is 100 legit. My family has something strange going on. None of this has been fraudulent, and I am a bit of a skeptic, so I am 100 with all of you in the realm of uncertainty. Still, I will tell the story of the strange handprints and activity at my mother's house. My name is Elijah, and I live in Milton, Vermont. I live with my grandmother and grandfather, and we live in a very isolated area. My mother lives in Burlington, Vermont, and I do not live with her as she has been struggling financially, although she is the most excellent mother anyone could ever ask for. My little sister, Marissa, currently resides in the residence with my mother at Northgate Apartments. This is the critical location for everything. I have written a creepy poem using the image from my mother's basement, as it has been chilling enough to inspire me. Manus. It all began in Northgate 404 when I lived with my mother. I would recall hearing strange noises radiating from the radiator. No pun intended. And the noises would haunt me significantly to the point where I would stay awake for literal hours. I was sleep deprived when I arrived at school. My teacher seemed genuinely concerned for me every time I came looking like a zombie until one day I returned home on the bus, exhausted as always. I noticed the basement door had been left wide open. I yelled up the stairs to my mom, asking if she had left the basement door open, and she yelled no back down to me, so I closed the door without a second thought. Every time I lay in bed, I felt like my eyes were watching me, and my friends always stated that they felt pressure every time they came over to visit. It was strange, but nothing short of a possible coincidence. Six years later, I no longer live in those apartments with my mother due to her trouble supporting my siblings and me, but my mother still currently resides in the apartment. My mother and my little sister Marissa come over frequently to visit for lunch and always come over and relay the real and strange experiences in these complex apartments. One day on our way home from church in the car, I was talking about my favorite horror games. And then my mother was talking about a strange handprint on the wall in the basement that just happened to appear. I am super skeptical and love all things horror. So this story intrigued me. I asked my mother if she had been home or if Marissa had been home. My mother works at Walmart pretty intensely as a team leader. And my little sister attends school pretty much every day. And the handprint is not child-sized, as I have learned. My mother explained that this wasn't the only strange event at the apartment. Objects move independently, as if misplaced or lost, and not where they originally were. For example, a figurine of a church seemed to move from the kitchen into the living room. A lamp seemingly fell over. And finally, my mother's boyfriend at the time had been locked in the bathroom room upstairs. While my mother was downstairs cleaning the dishes, my mother's boyfriend began to harass my sister Marissa and demand answers as to why she had locked him in the bathroom. These small things were bizarre, so I decided to investigate further. I returned to my mother's apartment, where I used to live, and it felt as strange yet familiar as it did before. I took my flashlight and my EMF downstairs. Yes, I brought my EMF, and I began to search for this so-called handprint. And then I found it on the wall in the messy and cold basement. For some reason, all of the hair stood on my arms and neck. I felt like I was freezing. And then I got a headache after staring at this handprint for about five minutes. I was uncomfortable. And the vibes radiating from that basement were horrifying. My mother has moved from 404 to 453. And she still has strange occurrences. For example, a trash can slides across the floor and peculiar scratch noises are heard from the basement, even when the cat is upstairs. Somehow, my mother's keys ended up in the basement just recently, and this is most certainly where she would least likely put them. And then, not too late, a handprint appears again in the basement. I knew I had to see it. I knew I had to investigate and record this phenomenon. Perhaps, whatever it is, it has followed her. But the day I went to my mother's new apartment in 453, I photographed the unique handprint on the basement wall. A month later, a strange handprint appeared on the wall above my computer, very close to the ceiling. 
and consistently. The lights flickered in my house, and my hair stood up at random times throughout the day. I have also photographed this. Further information. In between 404 and 453 was 72, and my mother had claimed to have seen a ghostly apparition on the ceiling when the lights flickered, and a cake had randomly fallen to the floor. However, it had been residing in the middle of the table. This is a relatively old story that my dad has told me a few times over the years. But with Halloween coming up, it's been on my mind again. I myself have never been able to witness the house, though the description I've been given by multiple men 20 or so years after seeing it gave me a very vivid mental image. To begin, I would like to mention that my father is a highly religious man, a preacher's son, and does not believe in ghosts or anything paranormal in the slightest. Nothing seems to spook him either, but he still swears up and down that he felt something unnatural that scared the hell out of him. Even just from mentioning the story to me on the rare occasion that he would bring it up. Back in the late 80s, he and a few friends would regularly hike over the waterfall or creek bed behind our farm and follow the trails up until they eventually met the frontage road off of the interstate. Well, one night they decided to take a different route to go around the backside of another farmer's land, mostly to see the animals because they owned emus and other large pets that weren't common in the local area. Supposedly, after leaving the area and continuing into the woods, at night of all wonderful times, they managed to stumble upon what is described by all five men 20 years later as a Blair Witch look-alike house. It was a very old home, and my dad claims that just looking at it gave him this overwhelming feeling. But of course, they had to go inside and check it out. Inside the house was a vintage cottage-style home that was probably built in the late 40s or early 50s, and the group was instantly met with writing and symbols in strange Latin-like languages, with a few English graffiti pieces that quoted a supposed satanic or pagan worshiping ritual. With Certain pieces describing how to sacrifice a human soul to some supposedly demonic deity. My father still claims to this day that certain symbols were painted on the walls in blood, while others were clearly spray paint. And I find it easier to believe because he also worked as a firefighter for years before this happened and had a lot of experience with having to see human blood and had a lot of experience with having to see human blood. And dismembered bodies on the freeway after car accidents. Past a small living kitchen area was a stairwell that was so small that their shoulders would physically brush either side of the wall as they went up, and the stairs went straight, stopped at a small landing, then turned right, so as you started up, you could not see what might be standing at them. Top, at the top of the stairs, a door led to a large attic-style bedroom where actual chain manacles and locks hung from one of the walls near a circular window at the end of the room, which was also completely covered in weird symbols. Graffiti, and now more obvious and frightening, large dried puddles of blood that had seeped into the floors and walls. Allegedly, once they were upstairs investigating the room, they swear that they heard someone moving up the stairwell behind them quickly, but when they looked back, there was no one there. Everyone basically told me that it sounded almost like eels clacking on wood. And now completely spooked, they rushed back down the stairs to see if someone was playing a prank on them and was hiding downstairs. Surprise, surprise. They found nothing and no new footprints in the dust and grime that differed from the ones they left on their way in. To keep things interesting, I met with each of the guys separately to ask them about what they remembered expecting to maybe find a crack or something to prove that maybe they were exaggerating. But when I asked them, I got the same answer from each of them with no hesitation. They got the same details right down to the minute that they entered the house and the minute they left. But here's where it gets really strange. They left the house and, for some unknown reason, decided to try walking back from a different route, using a compass to approach from the east instead of the south. They did this test more than 10 times that night, walking from every possible route or direction, yet they always came out at the front entrance of the house, 
Even when the compass and common knowledge of the area showed that it was physically impossible to be at the south end of the house when they moved in a straight line from the north, east, or west, there probably is some scientific explanation for it, but I haven't found one yet. These guys knew those woods literally like the back of their hands and still do to this day. The final time that the guys came back and found themselves standing at the front door of the house, they began to feel physically ill, verging on feverish, and finally decided that it was time to give up when one of them nearly fainted. As they turned to leave, the man who nearly fainted turned, looked up, and pointed at the circular window at the front of the house on the second story. Everyone looks and immediately sees a tall female figure hunched over standing in the window, watching them, though they see no features on her face other than two large dark colored eyes. And it sort of shuffled in place slightly before turning and walking away as if it were heading to the stairs. At the end of the room, at the sight of the figure actually moving, they all took off running through the woods, ending up on the side of the interstate about three miles from my dad's house, where they originally started from. They eventually made it back to my dad's place, though they claimed that they felt as if someone were following them the entire way. And my dad's cousin gets up to get some water from the kitchen, only to announce that he swore that he saw the same figure standing outside of the kitchen window near, the edge of the woods, close to the woodshed. Thankfully, nothing else came from the experience other than a collective state of absolute terror when the subject was brought up. They wrote off what his cousin saw as paranoia or pareidolia, though five years later, they decided to return to see if the house was still standing. Miraculously, it had fallen in on itself and was nothing more than a pile of rubble, and they never went back. I always joked with my dad and would ask him what he would do if he went back and found the house standing the same way it had back then, trying to give him a reason to let me go and see the place for myself. But with trespassing laws being far more prevalent in today's times, it would be nearly impossible without either getting shot or going to jail as it was not on our property. I don't know. It always gives me the creeps to think about it, but I never considered the story to be true until I did this little mock interview with all of the guys. And when I say that these grown men are scared to death by this story, I mean it. Seeing them get physically worked up and frightened by just telling the story really caused me to be less of a skeptic. What do you guys think? Could it be possible that they were just spooked and it caused them to see things? All three were in the last decade of my career. I spent 12 years walking the beat before I had the opportunity to step in and assist a detective and assisted detective in AC. I, on a double homicide, through my numerous connections from years on the streets, we managed to get several leads that led to the arrests of the guilty. I moved out of patrol and spent a decade investigating sex crimes, arsons, and armed robberies. I took advanced training seminars and workshops, studying past cases and offender modalities. I worked with the drug squads on serious assaults and the occasional murder before finding myself stepping in for a retiring detective. I was familiar with his partner, Connolly, and we became a good team. I bring this all up to emphasize that. I've seen horrific shit in my 33 years on the force. Images I'll never shake people who still haunt my dreams. I can honestly say that most of the criminals I've put away haven't been evil. They've all been motivated by something, however benign, to commit their acts. Then there are some who are on the fence, the ones that take violent crimes further than would typically be the case. And then there are those who dream up horrific atrocities to be inflicted on the world around them. Because why not? Patty Wilson fell somewhere beyond the shades of your typical serial killer. She was the first person I encountered on the job who I could reliably say had true evil in her. Patty was an Orn who had moved into an Obgen and birthing clinic in one of the city's lower class neighborhoods. This particular clinic had a terrible miscarriage and still birth rate, but the numbers were fudged and kept hidden. Eventually, people in the neighborhood started talking and word got out about how many deaths there were. Our station was contacted, 
and normally that type of thing would land on another desk. But we were short-staffed, so Connolly and I were brought in. Our investigation led us to Patty, and we found that in her 23 years at the clinic, there had been over 2,000 miscarriages. She'd been giving a chemical cocktail to the expectant mothers, claiming it would help with sleep. Instead, it gradually killed the fetus as it grew. We'd also discovered that after several dozen healthy births, Patty would take the baby away to be cleaned up, but would return with the horrible news that the baby had died shortly after being delivered. Our investigations into that didn't lead anywhere concrete, but one of the threads we were pulling on led us to believe Patty had been lying to the mothers, telling them their baby had died, when in fact the baby was healthy but was shipped off to the highest bidder. A live baby on the black market could fetch a tidy sum, whether for organ harvesting, stem cells, or something more deviant and horrific. We believed it was racially motivated, as almost all the miscarriages and stillbirths occurred exclusively with black parents. But Patty denied it all. I remember watching Patty in our first interview with her. Her face was normal and moved expressively as she spoke and answered our questions. But her eyes didn't. They were empty black holes. And the longer you stared into them, the more uncomfortable you became. Even after the trial, which had her serving multiple life sentences, Patty denied any wrongdoing. The next case, where I witnessed true evil, fractured into an investigation involving multiple events. Connolly and I were called in to investigate an attack on a beach volleyball tournament. On the city's largest beach, there was a national tournament with over 300 teams playing on 50 courts over the course of the weekend. The ages ranged from 12 to 65, and they were both men and women. During morning warm-ups before the first game on the first day, one scream turned into two screams, which turned into a hundred screams. Over one-third of the players needed immediate medical attention. Their feet, ankles, knees, thighs, hips, stomachs, and in some cases up to their shoulders and faces were covered in deep, gushing cuts. Someone had gone to the beach the night before the tournament and brought hundreds of small, flat pieces of wood with razor blades sticking up from the centers in an upside-down capital to shape. The wood was dug into the sand with the blade's sharp ends pointed upward and hidden just under the surface, so no one could see them. It must have taken hours to set up. There were no deaths, but the damage that was caused resulted in hundreds of injuries and several dozen athletic young adults with sliced Achilles tendons and a dwindling future in sports. As with every investigation, we started off at the crime scene and worked our way outward in tight, concentric circles. While the CCs were combing the beach, Connolly and I were interviewing the people who ran the tournament, looking for any enemies or people who might want to target them and this tournament in particular. But those led nowhere. Sadly, the CCs fared no better. The entire crime scene was a wash. There were so many footprints and shoe and sandal prints and the sandal prints in the sand that it was impossible to search for tracks. And the actual razor blades and pieces of wood had been doused in bleach before being placed in their small dugouts. There were no security cameras on the beach and the lone one that was in the parking lot didn't capture any cars between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. Our phones were ringing off the hook with tips but there were no real leads. After a month, we were nowhere in the investigation. Then a new investigation came in and our hamstrung department got even tighter. Connolly and I took it on as well. At a senior home along the city's waterfront, a fire had started in the basement. Because of the accelerants used, it quickly overtook the first two floors. From there, the rest of the eight-story building went up. 22 residents and nine staff members died in the fire all from smoke inhalation. We scoured the undamaged security footage, but again found no suspects around the parking lots or front entrances. The footage from the rear of the building was destroyed, so we couldn't check it. Then a third investigation dropped onto our desks. This time, there was a mass poisoning in a junior high school cafeteria. There were 23 deaths, 15 of which were students and over 100 severe injuries. Our investigation showed that someone had stealthily broken into the school overnight 
and poisoned every piece of food in the cafeteria stockroom, fridge, and freezer with arsenic. It was a miracle more people didn't die. All the school's exterior cameras were working, and after scouring them for clues, we finally found one at the back doors. The footage captured someone dressed in all black with a hood and ski mask over his face. He'd used a small set of lock picking tools to enter the back door, which led to the kitchen. He used the same door to exit and ran off across the soccer field towards the water. And everything made sense. The beach volleyball courts, the seniors home, and now this junior high, they all backed out onto the water. The school itself had taken advantage of that fact by introducing students to rowing, kayaking, sailing, swimming, and other sports and activities on the open sea. And the senior's home was partially marketed based on its incredible view of the water. We hypothesized that the three mass crimes were committed by the same individual. We marked all three locations on a map and scanned down the coast for all the marinas and harbors. Then we went back through all the routes and picked out various waterfront hotspots. We knew would have footage of their exteriors. Using the dates of the three incidents, we cross-checked the footage to try to find any repeat boats on the nights in question. We watched a lot of footage. There was only one boat that stood out. A large, older black speedboat being driven by a lone individual we couldn't make out details of. A red light glowed from inside the cabin. Connolly and I got pictures of the boat printed and went back to check the marinas and harbors. None of the docks we went to had seen the particular boat or had records of it, which made us think it was docking at a private residence. I spoke to one of my friends in narcotics named Waco, and he brought up the drug boats that had been populating the cove near the last dock we visited. It turned out that the many drug users in our city had been moving away from alleyways and sroes and onto small dinghies and drug boats, turning them into floating pill houses. The boats were harder for cops to break up or investigate, and you could float in the cove or out in the nearby channel for up to six months before having to vacate. Of course, the six-month rule was never enforced, so the cove kept getting busier with more and more drug boats. Waco offered to help. He went in one night and made his way around the 30 or so boats, which were loosely tied together. Waco found our black boat, he learned the owner was a guy people called Red. He was a dealer, and he let people use and pass out on board his boat afterwards. The next night, Waco went back and we followed from a distance with the Coast Guard. We had Waco wire, so we could hear everything on board. His plan was to get together with a few others to buy and use some heroin, then pass out. He would fake the shooting part and tend to fall asleep. Connolly and I listened in, hearing the details of the casual conversations going on from the other users as they bought and started prep. Soon enough, all the voices went quiet, including Waco's. A rough, agitated voice called out, asking if anyone was awake. There was no response. The voice belonging to Red laughed and said, good, we heard some shuffling. Then the engine on the boat revved into gear. The boat peeled out, leaving the cove behind. Waco had a GPS tracker in his shoe. So Connolly and I watched the boat on a monitor as it headed out to sea. We followed from a distance. The Coast Guard's lights all turned off and we went completely stealth. Connolly and I continued listening in. After several minutes, the engine died down. There were sounds of chains rustling, then clanking together. Waco's voice came over the mic in a hushed and frantic whisper. He's chaining us together. There's an anvil on one end. Our captain flipped the lights and sirens on and boat gunned it towards the blip on our radar. Over the mic, we heard Red notice the sirens. He started to panic and from what Waco told us, was about to toss the anvil over the side. But Waco was up and ready to fight. He surprised Red from behind and got him in a chokehold. When we arrived, Red was unconscious on the floor of the boat and Waco was sitting on his back. There were five users lying on the floor. They were all dead. Red had given them all spiked batches and they died minutes before. When we got back to land, interrogating Red was useless and terrifying. Useless because he said nothing and terrifying because of how he said nothing. 
He'd bitten off his tongue moments before we got him in the room. He was in the hospital for the next day and a half, before we sat him down with a pencil and paper. We didn't really need Red to talk, though. There was more than enough evidence to put him away for the deaths of the five people on the boat, and then divers found more bodies along the same stretch that Red boated on. Altogether, it appeared that Red was responsible for the deaths of over 50 people, and that didn't include the beach volleyball tournament, the senior's home, or the junior high school. The thing I remembered most about my brief time sitting across from Red during the interviews were his eyes, just like Patty. I watched his face move, twitch and wrinkle, but his eyes were always the same, empty and black, holding my gaze. We never got a reason or motive for any of it. We found out he'd been in and out of foster homes up until his 16th birthday. Coincidentally, enough, there was a house fire that killed both his foster parents and two other kids living there. After that, Red disappeared for a few years, got nabbed for an assault in a movie theater, and spent his 20s in and out of prison. Who knew how much destruction Red had caused over the course of his life? My third experience with true evil happened just as Connolly was nearing retirement. Poetically enough, it was our last case together. We'd been investigating the individual abductions of six Caucasian women between 18 and 22. It was a little old for grooming gangs, and we ruled out human trafficking. We'd done a ton of legwork and repeated interviews with friends and family. No one went back on previous statements. Everyone was solid. We didn't have a single person of interest. We did have one connection between the girls. They all traveled in similar underground heavy metal and punk rock circles. They also appeared to have a similar fascination with Satanism. Connolly and I went back over the details of each disappearance and found they all coincided with a certain opening band that occasionally played at a weekly death metal show. They were called Helvet and were a Norwegian black metal band. They were known for covering themselves in what looked like blood and performing in masks. Each mask was different but followed the typical design of a face with eyes, nose, and mouth. But the texture looked like dried skin. Dark, wicker twigs stuck out at the back of the head, resembling a porcupine. The more we read about them, the more they became our suspects. Connolly and I got an address and decided to go introduce ourselves. The place was on the outskirts of town, surrounded by a large plot of land and forest. We parked up the driveway, and I'll admit, on the walk up to the house, I was feeling nervous. It was dusk, and the sky was a darkening gradient of orange to dark blue. The residence itself was a large, old farmhouse. Death metal blared from somewhere inside, thudding out through the shuttering windows. There was a large black van parked out back and two sedans in front. A scream erupted from the house, louder than the death metal rock. I pulled my 9mm and Connolly pulled his. 38. We called for backup and went in through the front door, which was unlocked. The interior had a staircase to the right that led upstairs and a hallway to the left that led to a living room, dining room, and kitchen. More screams erupted along with the pounding music. We could tell the screams were coming from below us and found a door leading to a staircase to the basement. The screams and music got louder and were joined by chanting. Connolly led, trigger-fingered, creeping his way down the stairs. As he got to the bottom, Connolly swung out to clear the room. But someone was there. A tall mountain of a man in a dark mechanic suit, wearing one of the group's eerie masks, swung down at Connolly. Connolly saw it coming, firing his, 38 into the guy. My right ear blew out and my left was filled with ringing chanting and screaming. As I got my head back on, I saw that the man had swung down at Connolly with a hatchet and it lodged in Connolly's neck. He fell back but continued firing into the far end of the basement. I let my 9mm lead me around the corner. There were old bed sheets hanging from the ceiling, obscuring my vision of the basement. The heavy metal kept pumping and the chanting grew, but the screaming had stopped. I wanted to check on Connolly but I needed to clear the room. I stepped over the body Connolly had shot and followed the chanting. It led me through the sheets and into a large opening. Dozens of red candles were lit. There was a circle drawn on the floor, 
and inside it was an inverted pentagram painted in what looked like blood. In the far corner, the ground was dirt, and I could see several graves protruding from the earth. At the center of the pentagram, a young woman wearing barely rags was chained to pegs in the ground and had just given birth. On each point of the pentagram around her were what appeared to be the remains of five recently delivered and now dead babies. Kneeling in front of the exhausted and crying woman was another band member, dressed similar to the previous Hulk, smaller, and with a slightly different mask. He held the newest, just delivered baby in his hands as it cried. There were two other figures in the room, one over each of the kneeling guy's shoulders. The one to the right was holding a large, traditional two-handed sledgehammer. The handle was thick wood, and the mallet was solid iron, lined with carvings and covered in blood and innards. The guy on the left was holding an open book and had been guiding the others in the chanting. We all stared at each other in some strange, horrific standoff. The guy with the sledgehammer pulled first, lifting it to swing at me. I leveled up on him and walked two rounds into his chest before turning to the other two. The guy with the book threw it at me and lunged. I managed to get two more rounds off of him, but his momentum carried him through me and we hit the floor heavily. My head cracked the ground hard and I saw the familiar stars rushing to the edges of my vision. Everything sounded like it was underwater, but was moving really fast. I managed to turn my head and see the one remaining band member, the one holding the baby. He placed it on the ground at the center of the pentagram. He grabbed the sledgehammer from his dead friend and lifted it to slam down on the remaining baby. I didn't even realize it, but I still had my 9mm in my hand. Reflexively, I pulled the trigger repeatedly until it clicked empty. The final shot connected with the guy's head as he was about to swing down. He toppled back and the sledgehammer fell safely to the side. I don't remember much else after that. I woke up in the hospital and was informed that Connolly had died as had all the band members. The baby and the young woman had survived though. So there was that. The investigation was taken over by two other detectives and revealed that the band had been taking women from shows, bringing them back to the farmhouse and trying to impregnate them. Once they had gotten six pregnant, they planned a mass ritual sacrifice to be conducted after the final birth as an offering to the devil in some Faustian bargain. The other women had been killed after their deliveries and were buried at the far end of the basement. I never saw any of the band members' eyes when they were alive, because of the masks. Though I'm sure if I did, they'd carry the same darkness as Patty's and Red's. I said I'd seen true evil three times in my career, and that's true. But last time, there was more to what happened than what I put in my reports. It's the reason I retired immediately after the case. It's the thing that made me realize there was an evil I couldn't even begin to comprehend. I'd seen it right when I got into the basement and leveled off my 9mm at the three men. There was something else down there with us. It was floating in the middle of the circle, kind of like black smoke, but it stayed in place, wafting together before separating and reconnecting. Bolts of red electricity shot through it. The smoke got larger as the chanting grew. It pulsed, expanded, and reached out, forming the shape of a body. What gives me nightmares now is thinking about if that last baby had been killed and the smoke had finished solidifying. I'm terrified that whatever it would have manifested into would have shown me another realm of evil.